If you'll join me this afternoon in the ninth chapter of the book of Luke. I used this passage in our Wednesday night Bible study, but I did not go into any great lengths concerning it or anything. But the Lord spoke to me. I want you to use this passage this Sunday. I have a message for God's people. Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51, reading through verse 56. Luke chapter 9, 51 through 56, the King James text today reads, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up. This is referring when the time came that the Lord should die at Calvary. Not when he would ascend, but when he would be received in Jerusalem uh, with shouts and welcomes. Uh, so that ultimately he could be tried and go to the cross. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they, meaning the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was as though he, Jesus, would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Master, we love you, God. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost in the house of the Lord today. We thank you, Lord, for that marvelous old song that reminds us of the power and the reach of grace. Because of your grace, there is none so wicked that cannot be saved. Because of your grace, there is none so weak that he cannot, she cannot finish the course. There is none so sinful that they must be barred from the gates of glory. Master, today anoint the speaker. Anoint today the man of God. Help me, Lord, to deliver the word of the Lord that you've given me for your people at this hour. Anoint, touch every ear that is listening, not only now, but those who will listen later by reason of the internet. Let every heart today be receptive to the word that I'm about to preach. Cultivate the stony ground. Tear up today the fallow ground and prepare it, O oh God. Make it ready to receive the word of God that it might spring forth and grow and prosper and bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your glory. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm talking to us for a while today on the topic, deeper listening. Deeper listening. Most of us today are familiar with the term easy listening. This generally refers to a type of music that is gentle and pleasant upon the hearing. Some radio stations employ the label easy listening radio. But sadly, too many employ the practice of easy listening 
as it relates to the way in which they listen to those who preach and teach from the word of God. They hear the words which are spoken by the preacher or the teacher, but they go no deeper than this. But the word of God teaches us that we are to listen more deeply and not just hear the words which are spoken, but look for and hear the spirit that is behind the words. Peter and, excuse me, James and John came back to the Lord. We've gone into a Samaritan city trying to see if we couldn't find some accommodation for the evening so we could finish our trip tomorrow to Jerusalem. But the Samaritans were not real keen on Jews and knowing that Jesus was on a journey toward Jerusalem, they were even less inclined to want to be hospitable. And they told uh, James and John, I'm sorry, we have no place in this city for you. We're not interested in accommodating you. So James and John run back to Jesus and oh, how upset they are. This city is committing a sin according to the law of Moses. There were very strict rules about hospitality and generosity. And this city was proving to be very inhospitable. James and John suggested to the Lord, maybe we should call down fire. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Even as Elijah did upon this city in judgment of their inhospitality. And the Lord's response is so telling. He didn't just say, oh, you shouldn't speak like that. That's the wrong attitude. He didn't say that. No, the word of God tells us that Jesus rebuked them and said to them, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. This goes deeper than attitude. This goes to the very core of your spiritual being. And the Lord said, there is something off with your spirit. There is something off inside of you. If you could suggest that all because of inhospitality, we ought to pray God bring fire down upon this city said obviously you don't understand my mission obviously you don't understand why I'm here obviously you have no clue what I'm here to do but I'm not here to destroy men's lives I'm here to save them but how many people how many Christians in the world today would have heard James and John say these words and wouldn't have thought a thing in the world about it? How many people would have listened to James and John suggest that fire be called down from heaven upon these cities, this city to destroy it? And they wouldn't have flinched. They wouldn't have... Nothing about those words would have troubled them. Nothing about those words. At the very most, they might have said, Oh boy, oh, that's not the right reaction to have. No, you know, we, we shouldn't be like that. At the very most, they might have said that. The problem is, too many people in the church today hear with their ears, but they employ no discernment. They don't listen for the spirit that is behind the words. I'm going to tell you something. Honey, if you use a little discernment, my grandmother asked me well over 40 years ago when I was pastoring my first church, 
Uh, she asked me about this new TV preacher who was starting to become very popular and he was preaching this new message, this prosperity gospel. She said, what do you think of this guy? Have you seen this guy on television? And I said, yes, I have. And yes, I, I've, I've listened to him. I've watched him. She said, what do you think of him? And I said to her, just as straight, as plain as day, I said, he's got a demon. That man has a demon. Has nothing to do with the words coming off his lips. See, this is the problem. Too many people are focused on the words that come off the lips, but they're never, 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 never looking beyond the words to the spirit of the man. I said, that man's got a demon. I said, I'm going to tell you something. Of course, the Lord called me to prophetic ministry and every word I said has proven to be true. Every word I have said has proven right. And I looked at my grandmother and I said, I'm going to tell you something else. I said, that man is going to lead the church down a very dangerous path. He is going to lead millions of people who profess Christianity down a very dangerous path. He is going to lead them down a carnal path. He's going to lead them down a worldly path. He's going to lead them down a path that sounds good in their hearing, but it is not at all in keeping with the message of God's Word. And over the last many decades, Kenneth Copeland has done exactly that. One of the most ardent supporters of Donald Trump and the mega movement in America today from within the evangelical community is the false prophet Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland has led more Christians to backslide. I know from personal experience because I know many of these people. He's convinced them that if they're walking the way they're supposed to walk and living the way they're supposed to live, they'll never get sick. They'll never have trouble. Everything will go their way. Everything will go wonderful. And if they'll just keep sending money to his mailing address, God will make them rich and prosperous beyond their wildest imaginations. I have watched in the last four decades as dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of believers that I have known have fallen victim to this false teaching and this false doctrine. I've watched husbands grieving at the graveside of their wives and mourning the fact that she must not have been living right. She must not have been doing right. Because if she was, she wouldn't have died. This is the divine health fiction. The Word of God teaches that our God causes His Son to shine upon the just and the unjust. He causes the rain to fall upon the godly and the wicked. Honey, I've got news for you today. Just because you're a child of God, you will not be immune to trouble. You will not be immune to difficulties in this life. As a matter of fact, the Word of God says, Yea, and all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So that means, obviously, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to have some difficulties. But the doctrines that this charismatic false teacher began to bring into the church, I did not, it, I did not make my statement to my grandmother based upon the teaching that I heard coming off his lips. Because honestly, back then, he was so new that a lot of his foolishness was not fully developed yet, okay? No, at that point, he still sounded pretty much like every other evangelical preacher in America. But there was a spirit behind 
his words that troubled me literally to this day I feel it folks I kid you not and I would not say this lightly by any stretch of the imagination but from the first day I looked at that man I saw demons in his eye I look at him today I see those same demons and it has never changed Jesus heard the spirit that was behind the words that James and John spoke. It was not merely a matter of attitude. It was not nearly a matter of uh, personality. No, there was something more at work that would inspire such judgmental and critical words. And the Lord called them out for that. You see, the problem in the church world today, Tommy, is this. There are so many things that God's people could react to differently. But instead, they are as carnal and as worldly and as wicked as any unbeliever on the planet. They are as full of angst, they are as full of anger, they are as much looking for revenge, they are as much looking for retribution as any unbeliever. And yet they could easily, easily, easily respond to this situation in an entirely different fashion that don't cost them nothing. Look at the story, story we read today. <clears throat> the last portion of that passage gives it all away. The last sentence says this, and they went to another village. There was no need to call down fire from heaven to destroy village A because village B is right over here. Guess what, folks? They were traveling through the land of Samaritans. You know what that means? That means village B is going to be run by Samaritans the same way village A was the difference is the Samaritans in village A didn't want to be hospitable but the people the Samaritans of village B were happy to do so do you hear what I'm telling you oh I'm going to tell you Christians react with all kinds of anger all kinds of angst all kinds of negativity all kinds of nastiness to things that there is no reason in the world to react that way. Just go to another village. <laughs> Just do something different. You hear what I'm telling you now? It's that easy. I get sick and tired of hearing LGBT people scream and holler and yell because the bakery won't bake a cake for their wedding. Idiots, go to another bakery. Yes, but... They're not supposed to discriminate. I've got news for you, honey. If you don't want people to, to dictate to you by law what you must do and how you must do it, you've got to extend that same right to everybody else, whether you like it or not. And you know what's going to happen? The people who won't bake cakes for LGBT events are going to wind up losing all kinds of business. And the guys that will do it will wind up gaining all kinds of business. And by the time it's all said and done, the family members and the friends and the supporters of the LGBT people are going to go to the same bakery that did the cake for their gay friends. Instead of acting the fool over things, we just need to do something different. Instead of calling down fire on these people, instead of initiating lawsuits and all this other foolishness, which in turn emboldens them and makes them a celebrity in the fundamentalist and evangelical world. Idiots, why do you do this? That one 
county official, I can't remember her name now, for a while there she was all over the news, you know oh I won't issue a marriage license to LGBT couples, no sirree, but oh next thing you know she was a celebrity, next thing you know she traveling all over the country, speaking at churches, speaking at events I'm going to tell you something if you'd have just gone somewhere else and done what you had to do, that moron's voice would never have been heard outside of her office. Yeah. But oh no, we, we got to be the fool. We got to act the fool. We got to make a noise. We got to make a bunch of racket. We think that's the way to get things done. Not always. There's this little thing called wisdom. I've never seen a time in my life when people who call themselves Christians have operated with less wisdom than I've seen in the last 20 or 30 years. Christian people think every time they see something they don't like, it's their obligation to speak up and have something to say about it. And they make themselves a nuisance and they make themselves a bother and an annoyance when in reality all they had to do was do something different. Keep your mouth shut. The sons of thunder as they would come to be called, James and John, were prepared to call down fire from heaven to destroy an entire city over a matter that could easily be addressed by their simply going to another city. <laughs> their motivations were clearly anger and retribution. But the Lord was displeased with their violent display of a spirit and motivations which clearly contradicted all that was godly. His sharp rebuke was clear evidence that he did not endorse such thinking and certainly was not pleased with such a careless and destructive display. Many Christians today can be found lamenting and crying for action in response to matters that should require little more action than changing a TV channel or simply minding one's own business. The theology of fear dominates the fundamentalist and evangelical church world today. Preachers are constantly preaching warnings and dire predictions. They're embracing conspiracy theories and furthering evidenceless accusations in an effort to stir the people of God up into a fury and to ignite angst and anger. Watch Kenneth Copeland and see if you don't see that. I've watched him. I've seen it. But is this even remotely in keeping with the spirit by which we are called to operate as God's people? In 1 John 4 and 1, the Apostle John writes, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. I will tell you, over the years, even as an out preacher, I've met preachers. I've gone to churches to visit. I wasn't there to preach. I was just there to visit the church. And I, before the service, I might have opportunity to talk to the pastor, you know. I had this happen at a church and Mississippi many 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 years ago now and uh, I talked to the pastor after their Sunday morning service I went there to visit their church with a friend and while I was visiting uh, Jackson Mississippi 
and I visited with the pastor a little bit after the service in the vestibule and we were talking and the pastor said to me he said you know something brother he said I love your spirit he said there's something about your spirit that I really really like he said would you come preach for us tonight he said I never do this I never and believe me apostolic pastors do not ask anybody to preach for them that they don't know and know well or that they haven't gotten a, a recommendation from or, you know or concerning you know and but he said I love your spirit would you come preach for me tonight? I'm not going to go into all the details. I can't take the time. But God gave me a prophetic word for that church. And we had the most amazing service. There was a, a, a tornado warning while the service was going on. The power went out. People went out to their cars and drove their cars up close to the windows of the church that almost went down to the floor. And they let their car light shine through so there'd be a little bit of light in the sanctuary. When the power went out, I turned to where I knew the I knew the pastor was back here somewhere, you know. It was pitch black in the church. I turned around and I said, Preacher, what do you want me to do? He said, Brother, keep preaching. So I did. I kept preaching pitch black, couldn't see a thing. People drove their cars up. You, the rain was falling, you know, and the lights are coming through the window. We could have a little bit of light. In the, and I kept preaching and I kept preaching. I kept preaching. And that night I preached something prophetic that literally was pinpoint on the nose for that specific congregation. I'm not talking about something that applied to churches as a whole. No, 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 no. The Lord put something in my spirit that literally applied to that specific congregation. And after the service, the pastor said, Brother, God sent a prophet to our church tonight. He said, You turned around and said these words to me. He said, I got news for you. That is exactly, exactly, exactly what this denomination was planning to do with this congregation. He said, But I'm not going to let it happen. Hallelujah. I heard from the Lord tonight, and I'm not going to let it happen. And it had to do with segregating his church and taking the black members out and creating a separate congregation for the black folks. And I preached how evil and wicked and worldly and carnal that thinking was and that pastor was grateful. And he said, brother, I know I heard from God tonight. He said, I know I heard from the Lord tonight. He said, I'm not going to let my church be broken up. I'm not going to let race divide us in the heart of Mississippi. And why did that pastor even invite me to preach for him? Because he could feel my spirit. He knew, man, this guy is sincere. This guy is real. I've had more preachers. I'm telling you, folks, I have been in ministry a long time. I've had more preachers invite me to preach for them, and they've used the exact words that man used. I love your spirit. There's something about your spirit that just speaks to me. There's something that you, you, there's, your spirit just says to me that you are as sincere and as honest a man of God as ever there was one. I've had more preachers say that to me. That's one reason why. Amy, when I go visit you in Kansas and when I go to other states, I'm not afraid to go visit another church. I'm not afraid to go visit churches elsewhere because I know that if they're operating in the Holy Ghost at all, I know that if they have the Spirit of God within them at all, that they're going to be able to discern the Spirit that is within me. Am I perfect? No. Do I claim to be perfect? No. But honey, you ain't going to find a preacher more committed to doing what God's called him to do on this planet than this old fat boy standing right here. We've got a message of fear 
and division, a message of angst and anger and malice that is dominating the church world today because believers hear the words, but they're not trying to listen deeper. What's the spirit of this preacher? What's the spirit behind this man? Is it the spirit of God or is it another spirit? Would the Lord say, you are speaking my word and telling my truth? Or would the Lord say, you don't know what kind of spirit you're speaking from? But in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, the word of God declares, For God! hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind well my God have mercy if God hasn't given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind how come so many believers are leaving churches angry how come so many churches are leaving, uh, Christians are leaving churches full of angst and negativity? How come they're leaving with a, a fighting spirit, with an arguing spirit, ready to debate and argue and fight? All caught up in the speech of the preacher that was filled with culture war and politics. I told Tommy I met an old lady years ago. I was at a gas pump in Dallas. And I seen this poor old lady at another pump, you know, and she's trying to figure out. I don't think she'd ever pumped her own gas in her life. She's trying to figure out how she's supposed to do her credit card and how she's supposed to do everything, you know. And she was having a hard time. So I finished up with my gas real quick and I went over to her and I said, Ma'am, if you don't trust me, I said, I'm happy to help you. I said, I'm a preacher. I'm happy to help you pump your gas. I said, I can tell you're having a hard time. I said, unfortunately, the pump you're at it says you got to go in and pay at the, the desk you know I said so if you'll trust me I said I'll go give them your credit card we'll pump the gas and then I'll go get it for you because that's how they do it and she said oh praise the Lord and she was so grateful so I did I brought the credit card I come back out and I pumped her gas and when I got the credit card I came back I handed it to her and she said oh thank you she said oh I just thank God he sent a Christian to help me because I sure was having a hard time because boy I'll tell you that Obama first words off her lips was about Obama and how he was destroying the nation and how the country was going to hell and oh my god all of a sudden it all started pouring out of her and I said to myself in my mind I said she's the assembly of God if she's anything <laughs> I said I'll guarantee as sure as I'm alive this lady's the assembly of God so finally when she stopped griping and groaning and moaning and wailing about Obama and those evil Democrats, you know, I said to her, I said, ma'am, can I ask you, where do you go to church at? Guess what her answer was. Oh, you know, First Assembly of God over here. I said, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. You know why I knew it? Because I know the assemblies of God is dominated by that spirit. And the spirit behind everything she was saying was foul. The spirit behind everything she was saying was fear. The spirit behind everything she was saying was anxiety. But God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of power and of love and listen to this saints and of a sound mind why are so many Christians in the church world today constantly filled with all kinds of anxiety because the spirit behind what their pastor preaches is not God's spirit Don't believe every spirit. Try the spirits, whether they're of God or not. 
Oh, I want to tell you today, there is a reason that in the book of Psalms, David the psalmist wrote, Psalm 51 and verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Listen, and renew a right spirit within me. Every time we come to the house of God, that ought to be our cry. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Let my motivations be right. Let my thoughts be right. You know, help me, Lord, to be right inside and outside. Amen. But at the same time, Lord, there's something else I need you to help me with. I need you to renew and revive and restore a right spirit within me because it ain't too hard in this world of ours to get caught up in stuff and wind up coming under the influence of a spirit that is not God's. We become angry. We become vengeful. We become full of angst and negativity. In Matthew 23, 15, Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye come past sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, listen, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. I'm going to tell you something, there's a lot of preachers out there, folks. Oh, they're converting people to Christianity. Just like the scribes and Pharisees were converting people to Judaism. But Jesus said, once you've converted them, you make them twofold the child of hell that you are. You make them worse than you. Well, I'll tell you something, if you don't think there are preachers out there who are producing millions and millions and millions of children of hell, you haven't been paying attention. What are the attributes of a godly spirit? Is anger and fury a sign of a godly connection and a Christ-like spirit? I don't think so. In Isaiah 57, 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. If there's anything missing in the church today, honey, it's humility. Amen. I told Tommy years ago when I did my internship in the Church of God, I had the opportunity one time, a preacher who had pastored the church I did my internship in, uh, he had pastored for many years this church, and then he had moved to uh, his home state of, I want to say, West Virginia. I'd heard about him. I heard he was a marvelous man, and everybody thought the world of him. His church members thought the world of him. My cousin uh, 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 Jennifer and my Aunt Dorothy and all them, when they lived in Connecticut for a few years, that was the church they went to, and he was the pastor. And Jennifer told me, she said, she said, if you think Brother Gillum was an amazing man, she said, and he was. She said, but boy, I'm going to tell you, if you'd ever met this brother, and I can't think of his name, but she said he was like Brother Gillum. There was just something about him. You could just feel the, the love of God, the grace of God, just oozing out of his pores. And I said, Jennifer, I had the opportunity to hear him. Brother Day, that was his name. I speak his name in honor of him and, and to pay him homage because the man was amazing. He had come to Connecticut to do a wedding for somebody. And while he was there, the pastor of the church I was serving my internship in invited him to come preach, you know. And so that Sunday, I believe he preached Sunday morning and Sunday night. But that Sunday morning, he came to preach. And Brother Day got up in that pulpit and he began to speak. And there was such <laughs> to this day it moves me to this day 
There was such humility in that man that it, I, I can't hardly describe it. It made you feel like a worm. Not because he was standing there acting like he was something big. No, because he got up in that pulpit and he made himself so small. First words he said when he got up to preach, he said, I'll never understand why God called me to preach. He said, there ain't nothing about me that's deserving or worthy of such an honor as to preach the gospel, you know. And the humility coming off of his lips and the way he carried himself and brother, brother <laughs> after the service, Brother Carver and I, the pastor I did my internship under, <laughs> we were in his office and Brother Carver looked at me, he had tears in his eyes and he said, Chuck, did you feel that spirit when that man got in the pulpit and I said, and I'm looking at him and I got tears running down my face and I said yes I did and he looked at me and he said I have never in my life seen such genuine sincere humility in my life brother Carter said and he said it made me look at myself and I felt like a worm and Brother Carver was a wonderful man, believe me. But that's, that's what that spirit of humility did. It makes, you know, when you, when you stand to look in a mirror, you know, you're able to kind of get a better idea of what you look like. Well, all of a sudden, when you're looking at somebody who is genuinely, sincerely humble to a fault, all of a sudden you're looking against that image and you're thinking, dear Lord, I don't look nothing like that. I'm nowhere near that. It humbled us. That is a spirit that we ought to possess. That is the kind of spirit that we ought to operate within. In 1 Corinthians 4.21, the Apostle Paul writes, What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Meekness is self-control. Meekness is not anger and angst and nastiness and malice. No, no, no. Meekness is you keep yourself in control. You keep yourself in order. You keep the bad attitudes and the bad spirits and the bad thoughts from coming off your lips. Hello now. In Genesis, excuse me, Galatians 6 and 1, again the Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, if any man, or excuse me, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The truth today is this, much of the church world has been swallowed up by a worldly spirit of carnal making. Ungodly preachers who are themselves carnal to the core are preaching a message which encourages God's people to embrace their inner carnality and falsely label it godly and spiritual. Nothing about their message is even close to the true message of Christ and the teachings of God's Word. Yet millions of professing Christians have become enslaved to this message of fear, anger, angst, and retribution. And for this reason, too many believers are easy listening. They hear the words spoken by these preachers, which at a surface level appear to sound good to them. Why? Because the words are spiritual, because they call us to rise up to God's standard? No, because the words are in keeping with their own human, carnal, natural thinking. 
They're not being called to think higher. So they're happy to become debased in their reasoning until the most carnal of messages is somehow contorted in their thinking and rings true for them in spite of its clear contradiction to all that is good and holy. The only way to combat this trend and to weed out the good from the bad, the godly from the carnal, the heavenly from the worldly, is to listen more deeply. To listen with discernment, not to the message, but rather to the spirit that inspires the message. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I've been in the church my whole life, and I've been in ministry for decades. If I was at all interested in using ministry to make money, if I was at all interested in using ministry to buttress my ego or my self-esteem, I know exactly what I could preach that would fill this place up tomorrow. Don't think I don't. Of course I do. I'm no idiot. I've been, I've been around a long time, folks. I know exactly what it would take to fill this place up tomorrow. Of course, it'd probably fill up with a bunch of straight people, but it'd be full nonetheless. Don't you think for one minute, I don't know, I do know, don't think for one minute the enemy hasn't come to me and said, you know you can fill this building up. You know that in a year you can have 100, 200, 300 people. All you got to do is preach this instead of this. Instead of being faithful to the message of one God, instead of being faithful to the message of Acts 2.38, instead of being faithful to this, instead of being faithful to that, oh, all you have to do. And surely God will understand because after all, isn't it more important that you fill the building? I mean, isn't that what your, what your goal is and what your end is? No, it is not, devil. Never has been, never will be. No, God called me to prophetic ministry. He called me to declare, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to preach what God gives me, whether people like it or not. He told me that I am not to be concerned with their faces. I'm not to be concerned with the reaction that I get to the message that I preach. I'm going to tell you something. If you can sit and listen to this preacher preach, you can go online and listen to messages going back 10, 12, 14 years and I guarantee you you're going to see absolute consistency mm -hmm. if you can listen to this preacher preach and you cannot discern and you cannot recognize you know what? There's something a little different about Pastor Charles. That guy is trying to tell the truth. He's trying to help people to walk as Christians are supposed to walk and live as Christians are supposed to live. Honey, if you can listen to this ministry and we've got decades of ministry that is documented, I mean, my God... It is easier to find out what I'm about and, and what this ministry is about than most preachers in America today. It's easier to find out. We've got all kinds of teaching, all kinds of preaching for decades available for you to investigate if you're so afraid to walk into the church. <laughs> Booby, to me, People ought to be able to recognize without a whole lot of effort that there's a spirit behind what I do. Mm -hmm. And it's not greed, it's not 
the desire for filthy lucre. It's not the desire to be a celebrity. It's not the desire to build a kingdom unto myself. No, it is a desire to do what God has called me to do, to be faithful so that one day when I close my eyes in this life and open my eyes in eternity, as I look into the face of my Jesus, I'm going to hear the words, I hope. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That is the one thing that I want more than anything in this world is to hear Jesus say those words. John chapter 10, verse 27. I've got to bring this to a close today as quickly as I can. The Lord said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Peter's words to the Lord in response to the Lord speaking of his pending crucifixion and suffering might have sounded to a discernmentless ear as comforting and supportive. But to the Lord Jesus Christ, they were born of the enemy and wicked in nature. The Lord's response to Peter included the very definition of carnal. Listen, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, O Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Here's the definition of carnality. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. We'll tell you, a lot of churches today, people go to church so they can be told how they can be prosperous, how they can be rich, mm -hmm. how they can have all kinds of worldly possessions, how they can be exalted and elevated in this life. Mm -hmm. And I've got news for you. Those are people who savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. In other words, they are carnal. They are worldly. They are not spiritually minded. They are not walking in the spirit. Some people might say, preacher, you don't preach the kind of message that I like to go to church to hear. Well, I'll tell you what then. <coughs> you know what that tells me? You just don't like truth. Because if there's anything that sets my soul on fire, it's the truth of God's Word. Amen. I, I'll go to a church, I, that same church in Mississippi that I visited that time, uh, they had the most uneventful, unexciting, honestly, it was not very nice, worship service that morning. That worship service bored me to tears. It was beyond terrible. They had musicians. They, you know, they had all the accoutrement, but the the songs they sang and the 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 uh, spirit with which they sang the songs, you know, it just was so lacking. And I just sat there and I said, "Oh my Lord, this is a miserable, miserable worship service." But then that pastor got up. And he preached a word. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That message he preached was on the money. It was a wonderful word from the Lord for the people of God. It was truth. And I left that service telling the friend that I had come with, 
Boy, that was a nice service. I love that. That preacher really gave us a word from the Lord. That was truth. I'm going to tell you something, honey. When you can't go to a church because the music isn't bright enough for you, and they don't have enough musicians, and they don't have a choir, and they don't have enough special singers, when it's more important to you, all the things that go on within a church service, except the delivery of the word of God, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Got news for you, honey. You can fool yourself all you want to. You're not walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. Because the one thing that ought to be more important to a child of God than anything in this world is not how many musicians the church has got. It's not how many members are sitting in the pew. It's not how many special singers and talented people they've got. No, it's not how big a production they can set forth. How they can entertain you keep you visually stimulated it ought to be the word amen and I won't tell you a little secret if I may say so myself and, and since I don't have a whole lot of people here to shout amen I'm going to have to say it for myself honey there's some good word come out of this pulpit Amen. I only know that because I go home and listen to it and I'm going to tell you, I don't listen to it like I'm listening to me. I listen to it like I was a stranger walking off the street. And I'm going to tell you, man, I, if I had a nickel for every time I shouted and danced and had a Holy Ghost Jubilee, listening to the message, the message, the message, the messenger's not important. The messenger means nothing to me. I couldn't give a flying fit that I'm the one doing the preaching. John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. I ascribe to that ideology. I could care less. I'm not talking about, oh, what a wonderful preacher. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a difference between, oh, what a wonderful preacher and, oh, what a wonderful message. Hallelujah. If you're a lover of truth, you'll love this church because, honey, we serve it up in spades. Hallelujah. Glory to God, or at least this preacher tries real hard. I had more to say, but I certainly don't have time to say it today. So I'm going to bring this message to a close right now. God has called us to deeper listening. He's called us to be discerning. He's called us to listen beyond the words that are preached, the words that are spoken. Honestly, even listen beyond the words that are sung. There's a little old lady, and I promise I'm, I'm bringing it to a close. There's a little old lady, probably in her 80s. I found a video online of this little old Church of God lady. She's at a camp meeting. I can't remember exactly which state it was. I want to say Arkansas, but I'm not sure. They asked this little lady to get up and sing a song. And I, I, I play it, sometimes the video is part of a, a video that I play before our services begin. And I'm sure a lot of people would listen to this little old lady with her crackling voice. And, you know, she doesn't have the most melodic voice. She doesn't sound like Dolly Parton or some great singer. She gets up there with her guitar and begins to sing. There's a land of pure delight over there Where our faith is lost in sight over there well, There's no sorrow and no sin No sin can enter in Oh, I want to tell you, that little lady starts to sing And I feel the Holy Ghost all over me The message and the words she's singing for one thing are so beautiful and so wonderful and so powerful just reminding us of all the virtues of heaven all the virtues of God's glory all the victory of God's people she said 
Noah won't have to fear whales over there. Hallelujah. Daniel won't have to fear the lions over there. Hallelujah. Said, oh, we're going to have a conversation with Elijah. We're going to have a conversation with Enoch. Oh, because they proved to us that you don't have to die to get over there. Hallelujah. Woo! I'm going to tell you, that little lady sings that song, and I feel the Holy Ghost more than I feel the Holy Ghost when some of the most polished bands and the most polished singing groups and Christian music get up to sing. You know why? Because I listen deeply. I'm not just listening to her voice. I'm not just listening to even the words of the song. No, but the spirit in that lady. The spirit that motivates her to sing these words. Whoo, you can feel it coming through, can't you, Tommy? Yeah. When that little lady sings, my God, you feel that spirit. Vestal Goodman, one of the most popular ladies in gospel music. Oh, when Vestal Goodman sings, you feel her spirit. You feel a good spirit. You feel a wonderful. You follow what I'm telling you today. Then there are other people I watch and I, I see online and they sing gospel music and I sit there and I like the song they're singing, but their spirit does nothing for me because it's obvious they're singing to be a celebrity. It's obvious that they're real proud of their talents and they're just trying to show off and be but God's called us children to listen deeply he's called us to deeper listening deeper listening to the preaching deeper listening to the teaching deeper listening to the singing do you feel the spirit that motivates that person do you sense the spirit that is within that person coming through and is that spirit compatible with the spirit of God does that spirit reflect the spirit of our Savior our King our Redeemer oh hallelujah children God has called us today to deeper listening glory to God amen if you stand with me at this time don't bring